Did you know FDA-approved Vivgot, Fgotigamod Alpha FCAB, is available for your adult patients? Visit vivgothcp.com to see the data and explore how it works. Vivgot is a registered trademark of Argenex. This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hello again. I'm Derek Stitt, neurologist at Mayo Clinic. In this neurology podcast, I'm delighted to be joined by Andrew Callen, neuroradiologist at the University of Colorado. Andrew and his colleagues have written a very helpful paper in the Green Journal just released this April titled Relationship of Burn Score, Spinal Elastance, and Opening Pressure in Spontaneous Intracranial Hypotension. Andrew, thanks for lending your time and your expertise to the neurology podcast. Hi, Derek. Happy to be here and thanks for having me on. So, Andrew, the field of CSF dynamics is relatively a newly established corner of neurology, and it seems that already it's amidst its own renaissance age in the last decade with the discovery of CSF venous fistula as a substantial source of CSF leak and the honing of all these fancy advanced imaging techniques that you folks use to detect them, like digital subtraction myelogram and dynamic CT myelography. Also, it seems we've expanded the range of the clinical phenotype with which leads can present, and I'm vastly oversummarizing here, but it's not all just orthostatic headache. And I mentioned this evolution over time because I think your paper does a nice job of juxtaposing the old and the new when it comes to some aspects of the workup of suspected CSF leak. And so to set the stage for the listeners, your study included 53 patients referred by a neurologist for imaging to look for suspected CSF leak, and you compared three items. The burn score for each patient, which we'll get into what that means in a minute, their individual opening pressures with lumbar puncture, and their spinal elastance measured with pressure augmentation. Is that correct? That is correct. As you said, our understanding of what the imaging phenotype and clinical phenotype of patients with a CSF leak is has changed a lot over the, the last several years. We used to think that a patient with a CSF leak must have a grossly positive brain MRI and an epidural fluid collection on their spine MRI and must have a characteristic orthostatic headache. And we're learning now that patients can have very subtle findings present on their brain MRI, which can be nicely demonstrated using the burn score to quantify that brain MRI. And patients with a CSF venous fistula won't have an epidural fluid collection. And then finally, that patients, the longer they live with their CSF leak, the less likely their headache is going to be orthostatic, or in some cases, they won't have a headache at all. So if we are in a new age of understanding of this disease, and it requires sort of a new approach and synthesis of a lot of different pieces of data in order to understand what's going on. Great. For those that might not be familiar, if you could break down what goes into the burn score, what are the components that you look at? Talk a little bit about the probabilistic scoring for the score. This is a probabilistic scoring system that was developed by the group out in Bern, Switzerland, initially looking at the likelihood of discovering a type 1 or type 2 CSF leak, meaning a dural defect or ruptured meningeal diverticulum or nerve root sleeve, based on findings in the brain MRI. It's a combination of quantitative measurements related to the mammalopontine interval, the prepontine interval, and the supracellar interval. There's certain degrees of narrowing. The supracellar interval should be greater than four millimeters. The prepontine interval should be f- greater than five millimeters, and the mammalopontine interval greater than 6.5 millimeters. A narrowing of any of those intervals receives point values, two for supracellar narrowing and one for prepontine and mammalopontine narrowing. And then there's also some qualitative observations, the presence of Pachymeningeal enhancement, perhaps the most recognizable feature of intracranial hypovolemia, that diffuse, smooth circumferential enhancement, and venous engorgement. Both of those receive two points. And then the presence of a subdural fluid collection receives one point. And these points are summed, where two or less points indicates low probability of finding a leak, three to four points indicates moderate probability of finding a leak, and five or more points indicates high probability of finding a leak. I think it's time for us to get into the results. Opening pressure is still included in the ICHD criteria for low pressure headache, but in your study, how good was opening pressure at predicting discovery of a leak? It was not good. And I should start by saying the types of leaks that we were analyzing here, the majority of these leaks were CSF venous fistula. Um, In total, um, you know, 94% of our leaks had an opening pressure that was within the normal range. So if these patients were not to have undergone advanced diagnostic testing, they would have been misdiagnosed as not having a leak. 
And so this, this was sort of the main takeaway from our paper, a reinforcement of this notion that opening pressure is not a good tool in identifying those patients who have a leak when used in isolation. And it seems even particularly and perhaps more strongly so in the context of CSFDS fistula. It seems it doesn't get much more unequivocal than that, especially for fistula. What about elastins in those confirmed leak patients compared to those patients who ended up showing no imaging evidence for CSF leak? So elastins was different in those patients with a leak and those without, but that difference was not statistically significant. In contrast to prior studies, like the one out of UCSF by Caton and colleagues, that looked at a very small group of, of patients with CSF venous fistula. However, the elastins was correlated significantly to components of the burn score, and the burn score was, again, correlated with the presence of a leak. So there was sort of this triangular association with these variables, but on its own, the elastins did not predict uh, the presence of a leak in a statistically significant manner. Getting back to the burn score, we do talk about the burn score quite a bit at my institution in patients with possible leak, and it sounds like your paper is more good news on that subject. It sounds like it fared pretty well with predicting leaks in your study compared to the prior data that was out there with the digital subtraction myelogram. Now you're comparing it with detecting leaks on a dynamic CT myelogram. That's correct, right? Yeah, that's correct. We also find the burn score very, very helpful. We performed another analysis before and after introducing a, a standardized reporting template, which included the burn score, and found that radiologists using the burn score when assessing for signs of SIH were less likely to miss subtle findings, which were then uh, downstream associated with finding a leak. So we do find it very practically useful, and it also naturally has good applications for research uh, in that it is a scoring system and it's quantifiable. Even if we excluded the presence or absence of pacumeningeal enhancement from the score, the restricted burn score that we called it maintained its predictive validity in that the score was higher in those with a leak found compared with those without. And that was statistically significant. I think this is very important. I think that we shouldn't dismiss an MRI brain as non-diagnostic for the presence of findings of SIH just because there's no contrast on board. I really agree with that because it is something that is encountered all too frequently. The patient shows up in clinic and and you you take the history and you do think that leak is certainly in the differential, if not high in the differential. And it's good to know that all hope is not lost if they come in with an MRI without contrast and that with the burn score, there is some light at the end of the tunnel. So I'm glad to hear that. I'm fascinated by the techniques that experts like you employ to find these leaks and measure these parameters, but obviously it does require a lot of resources from a technological standpoint, a personnel standpoint, that a lot of times are only available at quaternary referral uh, institutions like yours and, and like mine. So I inevitably think about the brilliant and hardworking neurologists, you know, who are everywhere else who come across a patient who they think might have a leak. For those folks, could you maybe give us two or three pearls or pitfalls regarding the first few steps to undertake for a patient's workup that your paper backs up? Yeah, I mean, I think that for neurologists working in the community with a patient in whom they suspect intracranial hypotension, obtaining neuroimaging is a good first step, but they should not be dissuaded from pursuing the diagnosis further if that imaging results as negative. The patient may truly have a quote-unquote normal MRI of the brain and have a a CSF leak or venous fistula. We know that somewhere around a fifth of those patients exist. And if the radiologist reading that study was not familiar with the burn score, for example, they may not have been uh, keyed into some some nuanced features. But that's number one. And number two, if your institution isn't able to perform either DSM or dynamic CTM, it's possible and probably more likely that your institution can offer the patient a blood patch, either through anesthesia or radiology. And so often just getting that patient a blood patch can help immensely symptomatically for that patient until they're able to get into a quaternary referral center. But that would be my main takeaway is, is have a little bit of, of a nuanced notion of, of what the, the imaging means and what it doesn't mean. And just because it's negative, don't stop there and, and consider offering that patient a blood patch before they can be seen by a center that's equipped to perform that advanced testing. Perfect. I think that's really high yield. And one other little thing that I'll just mention that that I was a fan of mentioned in your discussion was the idea of including a burn score template into the brain MRI reports of MRIs that are ordered for possible leak. I think that would get the ball rolling or at least help the neurologist know the probabilistic situation of where they're at based on the radiographic features. And then that might prompt them to refer the patient on if they don't have the resources or consider a blood patch, an empiric patch there. So that might be something that I'd like to see on the horizon. I don't obviously it requires a lot more dissemination of this type of knowledge to not just to neurologists, but neuroradiologists. But uh, I'd like to see that in, in the future for sure. I agree. And I think that in addition to 
facilitating improved care for the patients. I think that the radiologists like it too. It's nice to sort of be able to convey a probability, an evidence-based probability, rather than just a sort of gestalt based on what you may or may not see and kind of puts the onus on the measurements rather than on the radiologists. It's also nice because it frames the, the impression in the context of a probability and won't inappropriately dismiss a patient from further workup, even in the context of a low probability, if the clinical suspicion is strong enough. So I think it's, it's very important for our patients and should be hopefully a part of standardized radiology reporting in this context in the future. I completely agree. Uh, Andrew, anything else that you'd like to highlight for our listeners that we didn't touch on so far? No, I think we covered the main practical points. One thing I was very intrigued by in terms of the results of our study was the fact that the spinal elastins did seem to correlate with the presence of dural thickening, venous engorgement, pituitary engorgement, and subdural collections, but not as much with components of brain sac, the narrowing of those mamelopontine or prepontine intervals. I find that very conceptually interesting. When some people have hypothesized that the findings on brain MRI relate to both the Monroe Kelly doctrine, the sort of engorgement of venous structures related to the CSF loss, and then also by this sort of loss of buoyancy component. And it seems like at least the elastin variable appears to correlate with those Monroe Kelly variables a little bit more than that buoyancy component. And I find that very interesting from a pathophysiologic perspective. It just makes me wonder what else is coded in this information that give us more insights into the pathophysiology of this disease and perhaps better testing for this disease in the future. I found that point very interesting too. It, it seems that the fact that there was that discrepancy could suggest that the morphological changes that we're seeing are coming from more than just one piece of the pathophysiological puzzle. It's not just the buoyancy, elastance. You know, it seems that there's multiple components contributing to what we're seeing on MRI, these changes. So uh, it just goes to show you how dynamic CSF dynamics uh, are, not to make a very corny uh, play on words. Yeah, absolutely. I think we've all seen brain MRIs where there's no sag at all, but a lot of venous engorgement. Others where, where the opposite is true. So yeah, patients all present differently and we definitely have a lot more to learn. Yeah. And going back to the opening pressure still being included in the low pressure headache criteria, you know, it's kind of like I've told my residents before, diagnostic criteria are great until they're not. And they're kind of like dairy products or deli meat. You need to always check the date uh, because, you know, (laughs) Things, things change over time. So I really uh, appreciate you pointing that part out too. So I think to summarize for our, our listeners, opening pressure does not seem to be reliable for detecting CSF leak, especially with CSF venous fistula. If it makes up a, uh, a significant portion of leaks, it really has not been shown to be helpful. And if you're trying to work up a patient for CSF leak, putting another a hole in someone's dura with a possible leak is not advised, especially if it's not going to bring you any closer to obtaining a diagnosis. Conversely, though, looking at the MRI with your radiology colleagues and trying to calculate a burn score seems like a very reasonable probabilistic tool that is uh, evidence-based with regard to projecting a likelihood for leak detection. And if you're looking at a case and it seems that there is very reasonable probability of of finding a leak, then based on what resources are available to you, whether it be an empiric blood patch or referring a patient to a a quaternary center where they can undergo some more advanced imaging for leak detection and intervention is probably the way to go. If that sounds reasonable to you, Andrew, I think that would be probably the big take-home messages that I gleaned from your work and I really appreciate it. Yeah, I agree completely. I think that was a good summary. And thank you for having me on and and featuring our work. Well, that's all for us today. I'm Derek Stitt for the Neurology Podcast. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, where you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology specific topics you want to learn about.